Hi guys, this is App on Rapper. I'm back with my walkthrough for her story. I've been putting all the clips in order. Uh, so far I've done all six, all the first six uh, interviews and now I'm on the last one, the seventh, in which she's wearing white and uh, takes place on 7.03.1994. Uh, this is a really long one, so get comfortable and enjoy. This is a nice of them. This is where you take people when it's time to arrest them. Yes, I understand my rights. No, I don't need a lawyer. Yes, no lawyer. What are you going to arrest me for? I didn't murder Simon. You've got it wrong. You've got the wrong person. Yes, I'll take a lie detector test. I've never taken a lie detector test before. Does it really work? Yes, my name is Hannah Smith. Oh, shit. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I get it, I get it. <clears throat> yes. 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 No. Yes. Yes. No. 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 I could take the stuff off now. Did I prove I'm innocent? My name. That was the only question I failed. <laughs> Your lie detector works. My mother called me Eve. Well, she wasn't my real mother, but she raised me. Do you want to hear the story? It's a real life fairy tale. Across the road, where my parents first lived there, was a midwife called Florence. When Hannah was born, I was born at the same time. The midwife was there to help. I'd been throttled by the cord, probably wrapped around my neck by Hannah. The midwife told my mother I was dead. But I wasn't. She wrote all this stuff in a diary. Amazing what people will admit to on paper. Florence took me home with her. Mother hadn't been expecting twins and had a healthy baby. I guess she was just happy for Florence to clean up. Take away the evidence that this was anything but a happy occasion. Mm -hmm. 
Florence raised me in her home. I never left it. She kept me out of sight. It wasn't odd for people to see a midwife with a baby, carrying in supplies, washing nappies, that sort of thing. I never knew any different. I grew up looking out of my window and seeing her across the road. I thought it was like a reflection in the mirror. She was me. <clears throat> yes. The first time we saw each other, it was strange. We both realised at the same moment, I think. We must have seen each other before, but there was this instant when we first realised it wasn't a reflection. The reflection was staring back. I think I was five. It was my birthday. My reflection was wearing a party hat and waving. I knew what party hats were from books. And it suddenly occurred to me, today must be my birthday. I waved back and we just spent ages waving at each other and copying each other's movements. Mother wanted me to grow my hair long, but I kept cutting it myself. I wanted to look like my reflection. She always had short hair when she was little. Mother would hide the scissors, but I would find a way. Cut it with a bread knife, something like that. My reflection would always leave her house and go on adventures, but I never could. Mother taught me at home, and I had books and TV. Oh, TV was magical, but it was only on when it wanted to be, so I spent a lot of time reading books. Fairy tales. Stories about lost princesses, evil witches, magical mirrors and lost children. So you see, even before I knew the truth, I'd found it in those stories. Florence was a warm, kind person. But she was broken, I guess. When I found her diary, I also found a biscuit tin with other stuff in it. All the papers, letters, that kind of thing. Her story was in there. I never really spoke to her about it. I was far too young to really understand, I guess. I just put it together later, once I was older. She had loved children, planned to have a large family, but her husband died in the war. And that was back when you married for life. She never felt like she could marry again. Isn't that strange? She was a widow from her twenties. But I mean, I guess it was different then. You know, you married for life and she felt she could never marry again. I guess it was harder, a war widow. One of the dead. I, I don't know, maybe there was more to it than that. I don't really know. No, it was just me and her. It was the name they were going to call their first child. They talked about it and were going to try when it came back. Florence's family had a history of first-born girls, so they were convinced it was going to be a girl. It's hard to know if this is all true. 
These are stories I remember that I read when I was a child. Maybe I misread, maybe I misunderstood. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to remember what happened last week. Um, when I was eight, mother died. She slipped down the stairs. It was an accident. I had read a diary at that point and I knew she wasn't my real mother. So I burned the diary that day and I left. Walked out and across the street. I wanted to see my reflection. I thought that if I touched her, something would happen. We would become one, one girl. The fairy tale was over, the witch was dead, and I'd be restored to my rightful place. She recognised me from the window. She told me to come inside and she hid me. They had made the attic into a place where Hannah could play. It was a dollhouse. She hid me up there. No one else ever went into the attic. It was her place. I'm not sure where the dollhouse came from. I don't know if it was given to them or they inherited it. I mean, they wouldn't have had the money to buy it. It was so huge. <laughs> it must have been taken up to the attic in parts and then reassembled up there. It is a beautiful thing. Wallpaper to scale. Little furniture. The lights work. Mirrors, beds. Big duvets and pillows. We spent hours and hours playing it. We invented all these characters and families who lived there. We wrote paperwork for them all. Passports, diaries, and gave them all really elaborate stories. Once, a moth got trapped in there. We'd left a light on. It was making the most horrendous noise. We tried to kill it, but it was tough. We ended up crushing it under a copy of the Arabian Nights. It just became our way of life. We would swap places and take it in turns to do things. And we were very careful. Whoever had been out that day would come back and write a detailed diary so that we were on the same page. We had a list of rules that said what we could and couldn't do in any given situation. I mean, it was exhaustive. We lived a second life through those rules. Rules for things that could only ever happen inside our imaginations. I mean, we would consider all the permutations of future events and agree rules to walk our way through them. If one of us got hurt, the other one would have to be hurt too. A grazed knee, a bruise. When I lost my tooth first, we had to pull our hands to match. Once, I slept with a boy who was seeing another girl. The girlfriend came up to Hannah the next day and punched her in the face, gave her a huge black eye. That night, she had to do the same to me. She almost went too far. I couldn't see out of that eye for days. She snapped the frozen piece up for me from the kitchen. Mm. So much of our bodies were synchronised anyway. We started our period on the same day. All our childhood diseases, stomach bugs, nits. Mm. 
Mum and Dad had never had any reason to notice. They were always busy. If Hannah was eating a lot, they didn't mind. She didn't put on any weight. That girl has a healthy appetite. Um, if they heard us talking in the attic, they just thought it was Hannah playing one of her games. And that Eve was our imaginary friend. <laughs> Once, she was already up and dressed and ready to go to school and I snuck down for a piss. Mum saw me in my underwear and she went mad. Get dressed this instant! So I ducked into our bedroom <laughs> and seconds later out came Hannah, dressed and ready. Mum was amazed. When we weren't together, we'd send secret messages by tapping out a code that we'd learn from a book. The knock code. Something prisoners of war would use. We'd tap them out on radiator pipes or the attic floor. We loved our cat, Domino. Um, he had this little bell around his neck to stop him from killing birds in the garden. And we used to write each other notes and put them in the bell and we could send them to each other. Mum found some of the notes once and she thought I was just writing to myself because our handwriting was identical. And we had our own words for things, so she didn't quite understand them anyway. We were obsessed with fairy tales. Not just the pretty, pretty ones, but the traditional ones. They were dark and real, bizarre and violent. Felt like life. We had this huge old book that I think Mum must have bought from a library sale. The illustrations had thin tracing paper over them to protect them. They were in colour, shiny plates. At the front of the book, was an index of illustrations. We read that more than the actual stories. We'd read aloud the captions and flip between the pictures. There was something intimate about peeling back the tracing paper and dressing the pictures. Rapunzel's hair is cut. The eagle plucks out his heart. The princess pricks her finger. There were always princes and princesses. They were the special people, more important than the other characters in their stories. We knew we were like that. Twins, magical. We were the princesses. We had a poster of Princess Diana from the newspaper up in our attic. Had a pride of place. And underneath we used to put all our special things. When her engagement was announced, we were obsessed with everything she did. And later, when her life went so bad, we felt for her. Her divorce last year just kind of drew a line under things. When beautiful people died, we always felt like it was a sign. You remember Princess Grace, Grace Kelly? She died in a car crash the year before we met Simon. We used a Ouija board to speak to her and that gave us the power to find him. That's what we thought then, that people who die tragically leave some kind of magic behind. We used to share dreams. We used to wake up and write them down in our diaries immediately and compare them. Mum and Dad never knew what was going on and got so good at it. We were so in sync that we'd use each other to cheat. 
If one of us had a hangover, the other one would go to school. Whoever was best at a subject would sit the exam. There are lots of differences between us. Some things one is better than the other at. Differences? She's a better driver than me. She passed the test for us. I tried to take it and nearly crashed the car. <laughs> Learned that you can't rely on confidence to get you through everything. Mm. She is the shy one. She was especially shy around boys. If Hannah liked a boy, I would have to pursue him. It was that way with Carl. Hannah met him first. She had such a crush. I let him take my virginity after a night that his band had played at. It got difficult. When I was with Carl, we would have sex, but Hannah couldn't. Couldn't let him see she was a virgin. She had lots of excuses. After a while, we decided that I should take Hannah's virginity. It's not that different to a bruise, pulling a tooth, a graze. We used a hairbrush. After that, we took it in turns, though. I was always the one who seduced the boys. Until Simon. Hannah was so smitten with Simon. She started getting jealous. I didn't want to share. Even the first date. We went to see Tom Cruise at the old Odeon. We both went. Kept changing places in the toilet. We only had the one best dress, so we had to keep swapping clothes. Must have thought we had terrible bladder problems. The next date, it was my turn. Um, at the end, I let him kiss me. But that was it. We didn't want another car on our hands, and the Ouija board had said to hold back. After that, it was Hannah's turn, and she slept with him. Broke the rules. Deliberately broke the rules. She wanted to be the first to sleep with him. <laughs> I mean, that's when she got pregnant. From that one time. Can you imagine? I tried. I tried to get pregnant too, but it didn't happen. I slept with so many boys, men. My body refused. I think my period stopped because hers had. I was pretty ill. I mean, how could we stay the same now? I felt like Hannah had really fucked things up set us down separate paths. We had become different. No. The parents decided there would be a wedding. And after the wedding, Hannah moved in with his parents. There was no way I could follow. So we were separated again. I stayed in the attic. It was hard. It was like I suddenly didn't exist. I would sneak out, but in case anyone recognised me, I started wearing a wig. Hannah and I would meet up in the park. I was trying to get pregnant. But I couldn't. I mean, I couldn't do it with anyone we knew, so it was sex with strangers. Drunk guys I'd met in clubs, in parks and alleyways. I was 17. It felt like I was being punished. But it was Hannah who had betrayed us. I had to stop when one of the guys gave me an STD. When we met up, it was disturbing. 
For the first time, my reflection, she didn't look like me. She was fatter, flushed. If anything, I was getting skinnier. It's kind of hard to look sometimes. We talked about what to do. Was it time to become our own people? I mean, that seemed like the right thing to do, but neither of us wanted it. We agreed that her and Simon would get their own place as soon as possible, and then I could move in. And that was the plan. Hannah had a miscarriage. This was late in the pregnancy and it left her infertile. Felt like the universe had corrected its course. We were aligned again. But Hannah and Simon were still living with his parents. They were married. Simon had a job at the Glaciers now. Eric had given him a full-time position after he left school. And then... I was living in the attic. It was a very hard time. I was depressed. I was still pretty sick of the STD. And I came down one morning and... They were dead. They were in bed and both had been sick. They'd thrown up a lot. And I'd slept through it. The police said it was mushrooms they ate. Dad was a mushroom expert. I mean, he used to take us picking with him and he taught us how to recognize them. There's no way you would have picked death caps. But the police believe that's what happened. They never even looked in the attic. Yes, it was a cremation for the best. We both wore black and had veils, so it was easy. And after the funeral, everyone came back to the house. Hannah served up sandwiches. And I stayed out of sight. The legal stuff was completed very quickly. Hannah moved back in with Simon. Eric gave Simon the week off to help with the move. He decorated, modernised wallpaper curtains. Hannah insists the attic be left as it was, dollhouse and all. Simon never went up there. It lasted about six months. I tried to carry on, but everything was different. Hannah insisted I not pretend to be her around Simon, let alone sleep with him. We didn't share him like the others. The rules had changed. Me living in the attic had become weird in a way it hadn't been before. So I moved out. Got a small bed set. I got my tattoo to mark the occasion. I was singing in a bar in the evenings, so I had some money, enough money to cover my rent. And I've been doing something similar ever since. I haven't put down any roots. I don't exist. He saw me singing one of my shows, pure chance. Not sure I remember what he was even doing there. 
Afterwards, I had a drink at the bar and he came over and we got talking. I knew who he was. Obviously, I knew who he was. But he didn't know who I was. He was fascinated by the likeness. He guessed my name from my tattoo. <laughs> Told me it was a palindrome, and that would impress me. I enjoyed talking to him. It was amazing to be able to sit and interact and talk to him after all this time. He didn't tell me he was married. I'm not sure what he was thinking. He later told me it was like he was dreaming. A waking dream. No. No, he wasn't wearing his wedding ring. Nothing else happened that night. We talked, then I said goodbye. Then next week I was sitting in the bar again and there he was. And again the next week, he offered to buy me a meal. I told them I had already eaten, um, and so we got chips and ate on the beach instead. When we said goodbye, he asked me to kiss him. <laughs> Romantic. Yes. I thought about telling Hannah. I felt guilty after the kiss. But then it began to feel like this was the way it should be. Sharing, like we had before. He never mentioned her to me. There was the Simon with me and the Simon with her. It was almost like it was a different Simon. But After the kiss, the next time, he took me back to the house, to our parents' house, to their house. So, it was definitely him. <laughs> I sometimes think he wanted to get caught to prove to himself that we were different people. He told me about his marriage, told me how his wife was completely different to me. <laughs> <laughs> I almost burst out laughing. I think it was that time, the first time, at the house, in his bed, that I got pregnant. <laughs> Amazing, right? This fucking magic spell. And they say lightning doesn't strike twice. <laughs> I didn't tell him. I missed three periods. I had pretty irregular periods anyway, but three? I had always thought we were infertile. Both of us. I didn't tell him. Just waited. So Hannah and I were meeting for our birthday and I told her because I thought she would be happy for us both. I think she was. No. I told her it was one of my boyfriends, someone I had met in the bar. I think she was happy. But I could tell she was thinking, why couldn't it happen to her and Simon? They were the ones with the real life. Why not them? Then she told me she wanted to help more. She said I should move in with her. She would come clean with Simon about me. I was family, I couldn't have a baby in a bedsit. I told her I didn't want to tell Simon. Told her to wait for the time being.
when she went home, Simon had a birthday tea waiting. Afterwards, she told Simon about me, told him I was pregnant. She wanted me to move in with them, this sister he didn't know she had. She knew that instant. The look on his face. She sent him out of the house, kicked him out, <laughs> called me up, crying, and I went round. I guess I had a feeling I could hear something was wrong in her voice, but I wasn't sure what it was. She called me sister on the phone. She never calls me that. This was nine, about nine. I went round and she was waiting for me. She was furious and so angry, the kind of anger you can only have towards yourself. We screamed at each other, argued, cried, we fought. I hit her back, left a bruise. I had my wig on from performing and she tore it off. Eventually we grew tired of fighting and I left. It's like I told you before, I drove. I took the car and drove. I don't have my own car, but I have a spare set of keys. I just drove north. I wanted to think, put some space between me and them. Everything I told you before is true. I stopped at Glasgow. I was tired, exhausted. I pulled out and I hit a car. My car was okay, but I was worried about the baby, so I went to A&E to get the okay. Everything was fine. Slept in the car. When I woke, I tried to call Hannah from a payphone. She wasn't answering. And then I decided to drive back. I had decided that she was more important to me than Simon. Like I said before, it was three, something like that. I walked in saw Simon, he was on the floor of the living room. His throat had been cut. There was a lot of blood. Yeah, he was dead. She was sat behind him. She had my wig on. And she'd been there all day. And she had blood on her. And she was in shock. Her story is that she'd waited for him to come back. She put on my wig, some of my clothes, pretended to be me. They talked. She'd enjoyed being me. He said he wanted to be with me. Then he took out a present, another mirror just like the one he'd given her earlier. <laughs> that unique present. She went crazy, smashed the mirror. They argued, screamed. He hit her. So she grabbed a piece of the mirror and just swung it round. She cut his throat clean open. She'd only meant to scare him off. It happened very quickly. We hardly had to talk to each other. We agreed almost 
silently. The baby was what mattered. We'd help each other. We cleaned up. We bagged up the broken mirror, her clothes. They're gone. We took him down to the cellar. We knew I, we had an alibi and we wanted the body to be found later. We wanted to have suspicion on us so we could then disprove it rather than have it linger. Better to keep the body in the house than risk being seen with it. The watch, that was my touch to make sure the alibi stuck. My sister is gone. And she's never coming back. Can you arrest someone who doesn't exist? I'd like to speak to a lawyer now. Please. You have no murder weapon. You have nothing. And all these stories we've been telling each other, just that, stories. I'm back and that's everything. That's all the clips. Uh, so it answers a lot of questions, but also may raise a few. Uh, definitely something to mull over. Uh, before I go, I'm going to show you a few things on the screen that I didn't show in any of the other videos, just so you can see.
And that's everything. I hope you enjoyed this. I put a lot of work into it. So if you liked it, uh, please subscribe and I'll see you next time. Take care.